Well, I love your pastor. He is awesome. Well, I know he told you some weird stuff about me, that I am a pastor and a lawyer. I know that's weird. I mean, many of you are probably saying, I didn't even know you could be a Christian and a lawyer. But I am interesting, and, and you, you know in Texas, they have a special law for lawyers in Texas. Did you know if you're a lawyer in Texas and you die, you have to be buried at least six feet under? You know why? Because deep down, we're good people. Some of you will get that later. Um, but I am a church lawyer, so I represent over 190 uh, churches and ministries. We represent them in the cultural war that's going on, and uh, I'll probably say a little bit more about that in the seminar. Uh, we help churches with redo their bylaws, which has never been more needed than it is today. Articles of Incorporation, we have over a thousand different church documents that we help churches with, trying to keep them out of court because of the changing things that's happening in our country with gender and marriage and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we are definitely in battlefield earth and we're in a war over the truth. And so that's what we do. Uh, we also represent Christian-owned businesses, which is becoming a, a, a new big thing as many of them are seeking protection under the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court decision, we, we, we have about 25 uh, Christian-owned businesses that we help. That's brand new. Um, it's, it's weird because, uh, you know, when I went into this, uh, we, we, st we started this new phase of our ministry, which is just helping churches. I never dreamed in a million years that churches would need this kind of help. But our world is changing. We actually do some of this stuff international. We have one particular church in Canada where the pastor was arrested and uh, he was put in solitary confinement for seven straight days. And, you know, a lot of people don't believe me when I tell them that we are losing our religious liberty in America. And uh, there's coming a time when uh, just preaching the Bible will be considered hate speech. And so it's uh, really, really difficult territory. So, uh, one of the neatest things, though, that we do through Church Shield, and, and one of the reasons that I'm here today for Legacy Sunday, is that we do free wills, free living wills, and revocable living trusts. We also do advanced directives. We do a whole lot of stuff. So I want you to come to our Lunch and Learn. If you come to our Lunch and Learn today, I'm going to give you a golden ticket. How many of you have ever seen Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Uh-huh. You know, the golden ticket is free chocolate for life. So this is free estate planning for life. And so we're going to teach you how to do this. We're going to answer all your questions about how not to lose your mom's home or, uh, you know, how to make sure certain stuff doesn't go to probate uh, or should you have a trust. All these types of questions, we're going to do that uh, in this seminar and we're going to equip you. So part of what we're doing today with the wills and trusts is we're trying to help you in discipleship. Uh, how many of you don't have a will? All right, I know a guy. Okay, we're going to hook you up. We're going to hook you up today. You know, if you, have, if, you do, if you don't have a will and you die, I know three things about you. Number one, I know that you left too much money to the government, maybe all of it. Number two, I know that you left too little to your family and you could have left more. Number three, I know this, and this is the worst one. You left zero to God. Nothing. It's not even possible for you to, like, leave a gift to this church. Uh, if you die... With, without a will. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 13, 22, that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And so uh, this, what we're going to be talking to you about today is a stewardship issue. And so we're going to help you do three things. We're going to help you leave nothing to the government, leave the maximum amount that you can to your family, and leave something to the Lord if you choose. And uh, it's funny because in the first service I was telling pastor, that somebody wants to do their will, and they said, we can't join the church until September, but we want to do a will, and we want to leave something fantastic to this church. And so I, I was just like, wow, okay. Uh, and, and so I gave them one of the Willy Wonka cards. They, they, did, they didn't even sign up for the thing because they're, they're not, not a member. But, you know, it's, this is a great thing that we started doing for our, our churches, and I'll tell you a little bit more uh, in the seminar, but uh, in the last year and a half, since we started this, uh, we have seen $38 million come to our partner churches and ministries in Bequest. And 
what's so incredible about that is, is that we do everybody's will for free. We don't pressure anybody to leave anything to their church. It's just you can if you want to. And what we found is most people want to. Most, most people want to do something for their church. And uh, like we've left our church, uh, which is Sunnyvale First Baptist in, in our will. I've left, the, I've left them 10% uh, in my will uh, to my church. And is this on the Internet? If I die, they, somebody might kill me because they could pay off the church. Anyway, um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. Well, you know, I tithe in my life, tithe in my death. And uh, it's, a, it's a really great thing. So when, when you come today, uh, I'm going to tell you about some things that you, that you need to know that are very advantageous for your estate planning. I'm going to equip you. And uh, our wills are amazing. You can do them in 20 minutes or less. And uh, our, our software is best in class. You will be blown away by the things that we're going to equip you with today. And um, I'm going to take questions and answers. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you this, I promise you, I will not leave today until everybody's had your question answered. Even if we run out of time, you can find me afterwards and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you. I'm excited to be here on Legacy Sunday. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to the most famous verse in all the Bible. Most well-known verse. More people can quote this verse than any other verse in the Bible. What verse is that? It's not John C. 3.16. I know it's a mind-blowing, isn't it? Did you know more people can quote Genesis 1.1 1, 1 than any other verse in the Bible, including John 3.16? And this is the opening statement of the Bible. Now, as a lawyer, I've won over 100 trials, and I'll tell you this, the opening statement is a big deal. And so the Bible opens up with an incredible opening statement about God. It is simple, but it is profound. In Hebrew, it is seven words. I'll read it to you in Hebrew. Barashit, bara, Elohim, Hashemayim, Baha, Aretz. Which in your English Bible probably says something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What an incredible opening statement. It's an opening statement about design and about a designer. The Bible says that everything that is, everything that you see was created and designed by God. Now, what's interesting is, is that not everybody that lives on this planet with us thinks that this universe was designed by God. Now, here's what's interesting, though. Everybody on this universe admits there's design in the world. They'll say, you know, eyes were designed to see, ears were designed to hear, lungs were designed to breathe. So how do they explain that? The Bible believer says that this is design because it came from a designer. In fact, some people will tell you it's impossible to have a design without a designer. But here's what many people in the world tell us. They will say the things that you see that look like they're designed are actually, wait for it, undesigned design. Have you ever heard of something like that? That's an oxymoron, isn't it? That's like saying old baby, hot ice, uncooked barbecue, unpainted painting, unbuilt building. I mean, wh und what is undesigned design? So, they will tell you that you can see all this stuff in the world, but don't let your eyes fool you. It's just an accident. It's not designed. This was popularized by a man named Charles Darwin, who in 1859 wrote a book called Origin of Species. And I was recently in a Barnes & Noble buying a copy of Origin of Species. And anyway, I put the book down uh, you know, on the, on the desk to, to, to buy it because I was getting ready for a debate that I had. I was out of town. And as soon as I put the book down, the lady beside me goes, Oh, Charles Darwin, my hero. I thought, she doesn't know who I am. So I said, hey, uh, let me tell you why I'm buying this book. Um, I'm buying this book because I believe in God and I'm giving a talk tonight and uh, doing a little debate. But I said, can I recommend a book to you? She said, yes. I said, well, let me tell you something. 
Here's a book that was written about the same time period. It was written in 1802 by a man named William Paley. And he wrote a book called Natural Theology. I began to tell her this is an incredible book because it goes through what's called the teleological argument for the existence of God. It's the argument from design. And basically it says whenever you find design, you find a designer. And this book takes you through the Museum of Natural Theology. It goes through biology, anatomy, physiology, botany, astronomy. And what's incredible is it was written in 1802, so it doesn't have all the new things like DNA or um, genetics or embryology or microbiology. It doesn't have all these new things that they didn't know in Paley or Darwin's time. But what's incredible about this book, and everybody in this room should read the book, Natural Theology by William Paley. He gives an incredible argument that's very famous in this book that everybody in this room should be aware of, and it's called the watchmaker argument. William Paley said, let's say that you're walking through a forest where no human has ever been before. It's a natural virgin forest, and you're walking through the forest, and suddenly you come upon a watch, not just any watch, it's an immaculate watch. You pick up this watch, it's keeping time. And not only that, but it's the exact time. It's running. There's, Paley said there's no way that you would suddenly conclude that this watch just evolved right there on the ground by itself. William Paley said, your common sense, your mind would tell you that this was designed by none other than a watchmaker. Because watches that are just laying around in nowhere don't just suddenly somehow come to pass because they're much too complex for that. But Paley goes on. He says, more than that. He said, you keep walking through that forest. And he said, that watch is nothing. You could start finding things like bees, bumblebees, plants, animals, all kinds of things that are much more difficult to create than a watch. What do you think is harder to create? A protozoa or a watch? I mean, if we gave you billions of dollars and all the equipment that you needed in a lab, you could not create life from non-life. You can't do it. No one's ever done it. And by the way, even if somehow you ever did, and we won't, it would simply prove that it takes intelligence to create. And so William Paley goes through the whole book showing that the universe declares the glory of God that you have all this design which only points to a designer. I grew up in the country. I grew up in the country with a capital K. They didn't even have paved roads where I grew up. I grew up on a, on a dirt road and they had these things called graders. Anybody know what graders are? Graders go and they'd move all the rocks to the side so, so, so pickup trucks could go down the road and stuff. And I lived so far out in the country, I would have to walk over a mile to the bus stop. I tell my kids I'd walk uphill both ways, barefoot in the snow with a bobcat on my back. But I actually did have to watch, oh, walk, walk a mile to, to the bus stop. So I did the same thing every day walking to this bus stop. This is where I began to develop my little personality. I've got ADD. And uh, I've had it all my life. And uh, I will change the subject on myself. Um, you know, when I was a kid, they, they didn't have a cure for ADD like they do now. You know, kids today, they take medicine. When I was a kid, the cure for ADD was to beat the kid. I was cured many times, I'm going to tell you right now. So, but I used to go and I would walk to the bus stop. So I'd go down this dirt road and I did the same thing every day. Guess what I did on the way to the bus stop? It took me a while to get down there, so I'd always leave early. I would look for turtles. And as soon as I would find it, and I was good at finding these turtles, man. And I mean, if I had a good day, man, I could find five or six turtles on that mile walk. And guess what I did with the turtles? I would take the turtle from where he was, and I would stick him on top of the fence post. Oh, I was an artist. Man, let me tell you something. I was painting a portrait. So I would keep going until I found another turtle and then I would put him on the fence post and man on a good day I have just a row of turtles and I knew who went up and down that road who went up and down that road these good old boys with pickup trucks that didn't have air conditioning my dad was one of them my dad had RWD air conditioning you know what that is roll your window down and these good old boys they'd be going down that dirt road they'd 
see one of those turtles up on that thing. <laughs> How'd that get up there? Then keep going. Ah, there's another one. Look at that. And so, anyway, that became a very famous little stretch of road called Turtle Road. And people would always wonder, how, how did these turtles somehow get up there? Did they fly? Did they see? Did they somehow evolve and get some wings and fly up there? And, you know, did they fly up on top of those fence posts to save their lives? How many of you think that any of those farmers thought that somehow those turtles got up there all by themselves? Uh-uh. No. Every one of those, those redneck farmer rancher guys, they all knew the same thing. They knew that it took something more powerful than that turtle to get them up there. They knew that it took something more intelligent than that turtle. That turtle could try all day to climb up that fence post. He couldn't do it by himself. It took a higher power than the turtle, that was me, to take the turtle and put him on top of the fence post because they intuitively, intuitively knew that when they saw that turtle, they were looking at purpose they were looking at now it didn't have a great purpose but it had purpose they were looking at design it didn't have a great design but it was my design and they knew it when they saw it I mean you know it when you see it I mean you know how many of you would believe me if I told you that this guitar right here just evolved by accident and somehow it was in tune when it was just accidentally designed. No, this thing, Eddie Van Halen probably played that, uh, has purpose and design. How many of you think that if you spent your whole life trying to build a guitar, you could do it? Yeah, you could. But you know, much more complex than a guitar, much more complex than a watch, is a human being. And see, because not only do all designs require a designer, but the greater the design, the greater the designer. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me tell you what this says. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. You know what the word Elohim means? It is the word in the Bible for creator God. It happens to be the most used word for God in all the Bible. Used 2,750 times. Elohim. It has the plural ending of I am. Im. If you have one angel, you have a cherub. If you have more than one angel, you have cherubim. You just have one seraph, you have a seraph. But if you have more than one seraph, you have seraphim. And so this is Elohim. This is God in His fullness. His name means majesty, honor, and power. And the Bible says in the beginning, Elohim created. That word for create is the word bara. Everybody say bara. In our church shield, we have 100 and 190 mostly churches. We have about 20 different ministries. One of our churches is named Bara Church. It's in Westlake, Texas, right across from the Charles Schwab Center and, and stuff like this. And Ross Perot Jr. has given them land where they're going to build their new church up on the hill. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's called Bara Church. But do you know what Bara means in Hebrew? It means to create from nothing. Now, did you know only God can bara create? For example, a craftsman can make a guitar out of wood, metal, and plastic. But a craftsman cannot make a guitar from nothing. See, the whole world that we find, there's nobody that can do the kind of creation that God can do. I heard the story about a group of scientists who decided to confront God. They studied everything God did, and they, they decided they could do anything that God could do. And they went and they met with God. They scheduled a meeting with God. And they said, God, we figured out how you did it. We know what you did last summer. And anything that you can do, we can do. And we challenge you to a contest. God says, okay. Uh, how about we just do the first, like one of the first miracles I did when I made y'all. Make a man. They said, good. We were hoping you would choose that one. Why don't you go first? And God says, oh, I'd be glad to. So God picks up some dirt from the ground. You know, we're all made from the dust of the earth, from the, the dirt of the ground. 
And God breathed the breath of life into the dirt, and a living man was formed. The scientists said, ha, we can do that so easy. Watch this. And as the science, scientist reached down to get some dirt, God says, uh-uh-uh, use your own dirt. A carpenter can make a chair, but he can't make a chair from nothing. You know, and the Bible says that everything that you see was created from absolutely zero nothing. It's a borrow creation. Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, said, I'm glad I can't understand all the universe. It means somebody smarter than I made it. You know, every design requires a designer. And the greater the design, the greater the designer. And that's why you see this incredible creation. It points to the fact that there's a God. But do you realize that living designs require a living designer? You look at this universe, it'd be one thing if the whole universe came into be and everything was just lifeless and nobody knew that everything happened. But that's not the truth, is it? There's stuff alive on this universe. It's alive. You know why? Because you're here. You're, you're here and you're living and you understand what I'm talking about. But did you know this? It's a scientific law. You cannot find a living thing in this world that didn't have a parent. We're, we're all contingent beings. It means that we're all contingent on something else giving us our life. I went to Texas A&M, and I'll tell you what, we learned some pretty good stuff there. Did you know, I guarantee you, that every single person in this room had a mother. I know stuff about you. And I know that you had a father, too. And your father had a father, and your mother had a mother, and her mother had a mother, and her father had a father. It's getting deep, isn't it? But eventually, because the universe has not always existed, we know this from many different things. There's no scientist in the world that says the universe has been eternal. We know that everything had a moment in time where it came into being. So eventually, you, you, you come to the conclusion, you come to the understanding, there had to be a first mother and a first father. So the Bible tells us who they are. We actually know their names. Adam, the father of, of every single person uh, on this planet. And the, you know what the Bible calls Eve? It, it calls Eve the mother of all the living. And so we understand that God created the life. See, you're alive today. You're alive because you came from something that's alive. The fact that something is now alive in the world means that something has always been alive. That something, that someone is God. And the Bible gives us this incredible opening statement that you, 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 and you, and you are all here because you are the legacy of God. Genesis 1-1 is a statement about legacy. And he makes man. You know why you, every one of you in this room are so special? Because you are made in the very image of God. Animals aren't made in the image of God. But you're made in the image of God. And here's something that you may not realize, but you know it deep down in your heart. You know it's as true as anything that I'm going to say today. Every single person in this room is special beyond belief. So special. There's a never, ever been another you, and there will never, ever be another you. I don't even care if somebody cloned you. It still wouldn't be you. I have identical twins. In my family. Now, Becky and I, we have boy girl, boy girl twins, but they're not identical. People would always ask us when they were little, are they identical? We go, no. One's a boy, one's a girl, and they go, huh, but aren't they identical? Okay. So, but I actually have first cousins <laughs> that are identical genetically. Okay. They're different. They're not the same person. There's never, ever. See, because the world says that you are just a big accident, that you're just undesigned design. There's nothing amazing about you. There's nothing special about you that you're fungible. You know what fungible means? It means you're the same as any other. Money's fungible. You go, oh, please don't give me that dollar. I really wanted that one. I don't want that m and I want this one. Doritos are fungible. I mean, people are not fungible. Okay? You are a one-of-a-kind, uniquely made 
by God. You were wonderfully and fearfully made. You are God's legacy, and you were made for a purpose, and God created you for so much more. Some of you are so underliving what you were made for. We only have a limited life. And we've got to, we got to leave a legacy. Because I'm going to tell you something. On this Legacy Sunday, the biggest lie that the world teaches, and they don't even know anything about it. Scientists try to tell us what death is. You know what the world teaches about death? The world teaches that when you die, you're dead. There's nothing else. You have just ceased to exist. I debated an atheist one time. And I, and I mentioned hell. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as hell. And I can't go to hell. I said, why? He goes, because I don't believe in it. And I was like, what? So he said, so I'd appreciate you not mentioning it. And that once I realized it bugged him, I, I like mentioned it like 17 more times. But anyway, um, just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it's not true. And listen, the world teaches that when you're dead, you're dead. But here's what the Bible teaches. Now listen to me. The Bible teaches many things that God is. That God is love. God is light. God is life. But you know there's something in the Bible where it very specifically says, this is what God is not. You better pay attention. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And see, you would make a big mistake if you lived your life for this life is all it is. Let me tell you something. Life is so much more. We were created eternal. You were created with this God-shaped size vacuum in your heart because you know, you know you weren't just created to live and die and cease to exist. Every fiber of your being tells you that what I'm telling you is true. And this is just found in God's Word in the Bible because you are His legacy. And if you've never come a time, never come to a place in your life that you've committed your life to Him so you could find your true legacy, find your true purpose, you should do it. I close with this story because I'm out of time. There's a, the year was 1995. August the 2nd. Police were called to a murder scene in an apartment complex. They got there, and a young woman had been murdered. They checked for clues all over this apartment. They did fingerprints. They did luminol. They checked for blood spatter, all of this stuff. They found no clues except for one clue. They found a digital watch there. And I don't know if any of you back in the 90s, late 80s, had a digital watch. Anybody here have the calculator watch? Yeah, you're my people. A uh, pastor had one too. And, um, and so I don't even know why we had those watches, Pastor, because it's like you would be at the grocery store line and you just want to do some math or calculate the tax. I don't know. You know. But, I mean, we thought that was like the – I had a Palm Pilot too. And so I always had to have the, 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 the latest thing. So, anyway, they go to this murder scene and they find one of these calculator watches, okay? So they took it to the computer people. And they, they tried to find out who owned this thing and everything else. They got all the data off the watch, and all it had was just a code, a, like nine numbers. So they began to wonder, is it a driver's license number? Didn't match anything. Was it a Social Security number? No, it didn't match anything. Was it a frequent flyer mile number? No, it didn't match anything. And then somebody came up with the idea. They said, you know what? This is the, the, this is the kind of string of numbers you would see at a bank code. So they ran it, and sure enough, they discovered that it was a bank code right there in New York City. They even discovered who was the owner of the account with the code. They went to his house to arrest him, only to discover that his mother had evicted him. He had issues. I mean, he killed people, by the way. So she, she evicts him. So now he, they're looking for a homeless murderer out on the street. They had no way to find him. But they thought, what if he comes to the bank, because he still had some money in his account. So if he's homeless, he's going to need some money. So we just need to go stank out the bank. But the problem was, there were 17 branches of this bank in New York City. But guess what? They went and staked out all 17 of these branches, and they waited. Day after day, no one came to get the money. They were just about to give up when one day... He showed up in one of the branches. The teller called the police. The police came. They arrested him where he was eventually tried and convicted for murder. 
He was caught because his code was in the watch. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that you are sitting right now on something much greater than a watch, much more complex than a watch. Nobody that you know could make anything that we find in this world. They couldn't make any of the 11 million species that we find, which, by the way, are but one-tenth of all the species that have ever lived. They can't even come close. And you say, where did all this design come from? It came from the universe. And the Bible tells us that this universe was created by design. He left his very code in this entire universe. In fact, let me remind you of this code. Barashit bara, Elohim Hashemayim Baha Aretz. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to God. You say, Frank, how do I do that? I'm going to tell you how to do it today. It's by faith. You say, but I don't have enough faith to come to God. Listen, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can come to God. If you have the faith of a child, you can come to God. But if you try to figure out all the intricacies of the mysteries of the universe first before you come to God, you're, you're never going to make it because Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Impossible. The just shall live by faith, the Bible says in the book of Romans. Would you be willing to exercise your faith today and place your trust in Jesus Christ? It's not a leap of faith, it's a step of faith. Becoming a Christian is not a leap into the darkness, it's a step into the light. And maybe today, for the very first time, you'd like to take that step. It'll change your life. Or maybe you're here and you've been away from God and you you haven't had his purpose you know this you're not a bad person but you're not a completed person you're not a fulfilled person depression fills your heart and your mind thinks about death and thinks about that you haven't done what you were created to do listen did you know you can you can you can come back to God he waits the Bible says he's not far from each one of us, Acts chapter 17. And when you come back to God, let me tell you something, he can begin to pick up where you once left off. And maybe today you say, Frank, I, I need to do that. I need to, I need to come back to him. Look, just tell him in your heart, say, God, the rest of this life, the rest of this journey, I'm going to live it for you. That's just your decision in God. Father, I just pray for every single person in this room, Father. I just pray that, Lord, you would give us all the courage to live the legacy for you. Help us to be your men. Be your women. And live this thing out by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. We're going to have just a moment of invitation. If you'd like to make a spiritual decision, if you'd like to come to Christ, if you'd like to rededicate your life, join this church, be baptized, whatever your decision is, maybe you just need prayer today. I'm going to ask the pastor to come to the front. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. We're just going to give the Holy Spirit just a few moments to work. You come right now as we sing.